Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the best recordings of Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony, Symphony Number no. 7. Now, this is possibly, well, no, there are so many, the most problematic of all the Shostakovich symphonies in a lot of ways, but particularly in terms of the disparity between what it really does musically and what people think it does or what even Shostakovich encouraged people to think it does, because this is the symphony that was used as political propaganda during the Second World War, where it was supposed to depict depict the heroic Shostakovich, you know, portraying the triumphant spirit of the Russian people during the Nazi siege of Leningrad, and the bolero-like march in the first movement development section, which repeats and repeats and repeats the same trite little tune over and over again, was supposed to represent the advancing German army to which the Russians responded with unbelievable heroism and a tragic calamity of battle and fight and war and stuff and all of that. It doesn't do any of that. It patently doesn't do any of that. But Shostakovich's music fascinates me because, because if our motto here is keep on listening, then no composer shows the disparity more uh, between what the music really expresses, which is transparently obvious in my view, and what is said about it. And people talk endlessly about what it's supposed to mean and what its hidden meaning was and what the secret meaning was, but they'll do anything other than just listen to the damn music and let it express what it expresses and describe that accurately. And so what I propose to do in terms of the first movement, because it's tremendously long, it's almost a half hour long, and it's the most problematic of all of the movements in the symphony, I propose to do a little thematic analysis and simply explain what we're hearing. And what we're hearing, it seems to me, expressively, is, is perfectly simple and straightforward, if extremely long. And that is the other issue with the symphony. You know, the real problem is very, very simple. It takes really great con conducting to put this piece over. And in the World War II era, when everybody was scrambling to do it, even Toscanini did it, remember? Uh, you know, everybody did it. and and. It, it's an easy symphony in terms of it's like big moments to do well because they take care of themselves. It's a very difficult symphony to put across in its entirety because frankly, every movement is five to 10 movements longer than it needs to be. They really are. They just go on and you have to be able to conduct it in such a way as to make it not boring when it, you know, happens to have those big, wonderful moments and the dead spots in between. In that respect, it's a lot like another very famous work of, of obvious grandiosity, the Berlioz Requiem, where you, know, you listen to it for the big choral things with four brass bands and all that stuff and the huge climaxes, and then what do you do in between them? It takes a certain amount of conductorial genius to get through it in a way that sustains interest throughout. And Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony is like that. This doesn't mean it can't be done. It actually has a lot of very decent performances, but not a lot of what I would consider to be really great performances. And I don't want to listen to any but the really great performances, most of the time anyway, unless I'm reviewing cycles. And so I have, as recommendations, which we will get to momentarily, only five five recordings that are personal favorites of mine that I know are really stunning versions of this work. Now, of course, you will have your own. There are many, many others, some of which are very, very good. So I'm not saying you have to limit yourself to these five, but these are five that get the job done better than I think most of the others out there. So we'll talk about them in a minute. First, I really would like to get come to grips <clears throat> with the opening movement. The military, supposedly German Nazis and Russians and stuff happening. First of all, consider the key of the symphony, C major. It's not miserable. It's not a minor key symphony. Not at all. 
It's actually happy. It starts out happy. And I think that that's one of the first things we need to keep in mind. It is frankly happy. And uh, before we get to that frankly happy opening, I want to talk a little bit about Shostakovich's sonata form first movements, because there are quite a few of them in his, in his output, and they all have the same form. And once you understand what that form is, these very, very long, very sometimes difficult and, and seemingly meandering movements come into very clear focus. Shostakovich's first movement sonata form is based on one signal work, which you know probably very well. That's the first movement of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. And in specifically in two aspects of it. The two aspects are this. The first movement of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony has a development section, a big turbulent development section that's very, very, very tension-filled. And it's a battle. It's a battle between the, the motto theme, the forces of fate, and the thematic material of the first subject. It does not employ the more lyrical and relaxing second subject at all. And neither do most of Shostakovich's first movements. They're all based on development sections that work up to a, a huge frenzy of activity, a tremendous amount of conflict based on the opening material of the symphony. The second subjects in his sonata movements are always contrasting moments of relaxation, which occur later in their place in each time in the, re, in the, in the initial exposition and in the recapitulation, but almost never, never in the development section. Shostakovich limits his material very much. And secondly, the second aspect, which is based on the first movement of Tchaikovsky's fourth, is that the moment of recapitulation, the moment where the first theme, the first subject returns, is always at the height, the height of the dramatic conflict that takes place in the development section. There's always just this volcanic climax in the development section at the height of which the recapitulation begins by transforming the opening idea into its most anguished and agonizing form. And I want to play you Tchaikovsky's version of that because this is probably a passage you'll recognize from hearing that symphony. And I'm going to play it to the end of the development leading to the beginning of the recapitulation. And you'll see it. I'll mark where the recapitulation begins, just so you know, with the first theme. This is Shostakovich's model. And if you keep this single thought in mind, that you're going to have a, a two-subject exposition, that the development will be the first subject and the recapitulation will be the climax of the development section, just as in Tchaikovsky's fourth, then all the rest of it is detail. You just take it in and listen to how Shostakovich does it. But what he does is going to be very, very clear. So here's Maurice Bravenel with the Utah Symphony on Vox doing the recapitulation, the end of the development and recapitulation of the first movement of Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. Just listen to this. There you go. That is Shostakovich's technique in a nutshell. In the fifth, the seventh, the eighth, and the tenth. Okay, so that's the 
formal analysis. Now let's talk about the first movement of the Leningrad, which is, like I said, it's hugely long, 28 minutes long, usually 26 to 30, somewhere in there. Really very, very, very long. But its form is very, very simple because I just told you what it is. You have a happy first theme, a much more relaxed, lyrical second theme, and then you have a development section. And the development section contains the crazy, the crazy Nazi march thing. And it leads to an anguished climax that initiates the recapitulation. But it's all on a huge scale. The symphony uses a double brass section and lots of, you know, extra snare drums and cymbals and things. It just, it just makes a tremendous racket. It really does. But I want to play you the opening of the symphony because all of what happens in the development is contained in this opening. I kid you not. So our examples are all going to come from this fantastic performance on Naxos with uh, Vasily Petrenko and the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. It's a great performance. It's one of my top five. And let's listen just to the opening of the symphony and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Pay particular attention to groups of five notes. Da 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 dump. One, two, three, four, five. Just that. Because a lot of the thematic material is based on that rhythmic grouping. And it's going to turn out to be very, very, very important. Here you go. Okay, so there you go. It's the opening. It's very straightforward, isn't it? But there's a catch. Those five movement, five movement groups of notes are going to be the what we call the bolero. It's not bolero, but it's the the repeated snare drum rhythm that goes through almost the entire development section, because that rhythm is this. That's the rhythm, and the the sort of catch part of it, the that business is actually contained literally, literally in the opening theme. You don't believe me? Here it is. You just heard it. It's melodic, but that's the rhythm. That's it right there. And that's your snare drum rhythm. It's inherent to the first theme of the symphony. And then, and then, the whole first thematic complex sort of culminates in a screechy little woodwind refrain. One, two, three, four notes. It goes, ya da dum bum Here it is. Get that? Remember just those two repeated notes at the end of it. da dum bum bum that, my friends, is going to become the stupid, ridiculous little march theme that the development section consists mostly of, simply repeated over and over again in a giant crescendo with enriched orchestration. And here is a version of that particular theme as it's played on the strings, just from the middle of the development with the snare drum rhythm underneath. So you can hear how Shostakovich puts the two things together. Pay attention to those two repeated notes. Da, dum, bum, bum. Right? Here you go.
even here, Shostakovich takes great pains to highlight those two tiny ideas, a little group of five notes and that little phrase with two repeated notes at the end of it. And that little phrase, as you just heard with the March theme in the middle, it can go all kinds of ways. You can make other tunes out of it. It's terribly versatile. The only thing it has to have is blam, blam, two, two repeated notes at the end of it. And you know immediately where it comes from. And Shostakovich takes great pains to isolate these ideas in the exposition. So you hear them when they come back in the development. So that's what the development consists of. But what does that have to do with Nazis marching on Leningrad? Absolutely nothing. The point is that the music of the development is, a, is an incredibly strict, unbelievably strict, strict, really, really just insanely simple, uh, ridiculously obvious outcome of the music of the exposition of that first subject. Shostakovich isn't trying to hide anything here. What he's doing, quite simply, is taking two little tiny elements from the beginning of the symphony and turning them into a trite, rather catchy, kind of happy, jolly little tune that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger with each repetition. It's, it, it's a splendid piece of, of symphonic writing, but the question is, what does it mean? Well, we don't really find out initially other than the fact that the repetition is aggravating and that the tune is almost, almost obsessively stupid. It's a simple, simple trite, really trite is the word I was using, little tune, and I think that's probably accurate, especially that ridiculous version where you have, where you have the, the bassoon following the other woodwinds with each single phrase repeated and it's done with such monotonous, monotonous and predictable regularity. There is nothing sophisticated about this music at all. Nothing. Nothing. And then, of course, there's the climax of the whole passage, which is when the theme that supposedly represents the Russians comes roaring in on the brass. But there's something about that theme that you need to also think about. Let me play you that theme. You'll hear exactly what it is. And now that I've described how the development works, maybe it sounds a little familiar to you. That tune also has that silly repeated two note thing. In fact, it's anticipated by that wonderful little screech at the beginning of the exposition, which I'm going to play you again, just so you get to hear it. There's the screech. And also, you hear it anticipated in one of the one of the pardon me the repetitions of the tacky little bolero theme. It's a little another screamy thing in the order which is yeah da da dum bum. And here's that. I want you to hear that as well because it's all related. It's all the same stuff. Here it is. Right. So when the supposedly victorious Russian theme or whatever it's supposed to be comes roaring in, isn't it different? That's the whole point. It's not different at all. It's an attempt to get away, obviously, from the endless repetition of that initial theme. But as you can hear, the snare drum rhythm persists. It keeps roaring right underneath it for most of, most of the rest of the development section. And it turns out to be just another version of the same thing. And these two rather primitive tunes get into a huge conniption. They clobber each other. There's this tremendous battle that they get mixed up in. But what's the battle about? What's going on? My interpretation of it is very simple. It's a fight over nothing. It's an absolutely pointless, prostitution of the opening uh, opening of the symphony. 
that happy opening with that lyrical and beautifully quiet second subject that also goes on a minute longer than it needs to, doesn't matter. The point is, the point is that what gets created out of it in the development is, is, is mindless aggression. That's what it is. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's just mindless aggression. And that leads to the agonizing return of the symphony, which very, very gradually quiets down, only to be healed in a way by the return of the second subject, and then by a coda that begins with the beginning of the symphony again, now as it was, more peacefully, just when you think it's going to end, the snare drum rhythm comes back, and that trite little tune comes back, because the forces of evil, the negative forces, are never entirely vanquished. Never ever. They're always lying in wait. And that is what this first movement tells us. It's also very similar in terms of what it does, although in a different, you know, overall developmental format, to the first movement of Nielsen's Fifth Symphony, which has a snare drum, which represents the forces of evil, and which is ultimately vanquished in a huge climax, but not quite. The snare drum goes marching off into the distance. It's never really, really over, and the movement ends in exhausted peace. So, what does any of this have to do with Germans and Nazis and the Siege of Leningrad? It's nothing, nothing at all. Now, Shostakovich, in his, in, in his purported memoir, Testimony, did say, or is quoted as saying, that the symphony itself was never about the German invasion. It was about Russia being destroyed by Stalin. And that's a much, much more believable concept because isn't this central section a, a, a treatise on the evils of socialist realism, on the drooling simplicity that was being imposed on Soviet artists using the war and the circumstances of the war as a smokescreen in order to express a purely aesthetic dimension. That is, that, that music can be bastardized and prostituted when placed in the service of, of a false political ideology. Now that to me is a perfectly logical interpretation of what happens in this first movement. And uh, you may agree, you may disagree, but I do think it is entirely consistent with the course that the music actually takes. And I just hope this little, this little introduction to it has given you something to think about and at least allowed you to follow what's happening. The emotional effect that it has on you is, is going to be personal, of course. Every, everyone will have their own view of what's actually going on. But I think that that's a pretty, pretty logical inference to make with respect to the first movement. Now, the rest of the symphony is very straightforward. The second movement is a scherzo in simple ABA form. And again, it has its sort of spooky outer sections and a much more uh, sort of dance-like and perky middle section. And it goes on for about a minute or two longer than it needs to. The adagio, the adagio is a gorgeous, gorgeous movement of great seriousness and depth. Um, which again, it repeats itself, the, uh, principally in the second half. After the big central climax, it's in, it's in straight sonata form. It has two themes, a turbulent central section that leads up to a big climax that runs and spills over into the recapitulation. It's a form that we know. It's quite similar to that of the first movement. But, but again, it repeats itself Oh, uh, maybe for five minutes longer than it should. It's about 18 or 19 minutes long, normally. It's, it's a beautiful movement, but it, it, you have to sustain its length. And that ain't easy. And it ends with three quiet strokes on the tam-tam, which connect it to the finale, which runs in without a pause. And those three quiet strokes really should be played on this tam-tam, because listen to this. That is the sound 
that Shostakovich wants, and you need three of them. Unfortunately, half the time you don't even hear the three Tam Tam strokes, and they have no atmosphere and mystery at all. It makes me crazy when that happens. Um, and, and I've given up looking for performances that really do it well, because they're really I mean, practically or none. All right, and the finale, which is about between 15 and 17 minutes long, actually actually is one of Shostakovich's more successful finales. I mean, it, it builds up a lot of energy. It goes very quickly for the most part. Then it bogs down for a coda, which builds up to this enormous, enormous climax that contains the return of the opening theme of the symphony and ends with some brass chords that sound like the end of Stravinsky's The Firebird before just this enormous, pounding, hysterical ending that is the loudest thing in the entire universe. And I think the ending is perfectly convincing. Some people have problems with it. I never have. I think it works very, very well. And that's the Leningrad <laughs> Symphony. But it's long. It's a hall, and it can die a thousand deaths if it's not conducted with, with serious focus and concentration and completely uninhibited joy in the noise that it makes and the darkness that creeps up on it now and again. So let me talk about the performances that I like the best. First of all, as I mentioned, there is Petrenko on Naxos with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic, part of his absolutely superb cycle. It is splendid, absolutely splendid. Another, really, this is a classic, a great, great performance. Pavo Berglund with the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. His Shostakovich performances were almost, almost all terrific. They were very, very strong, especially 6 and 11, which we'll get to soon in this series. But his Leningrad Symphony, this is one of those performances that has sort of this vintage EMI sound. It's like recorded in a barn. It's a big acoustic with that really encompasses the size of the piece. And it's a very it's Berglund, you know. He he was into into string articulation and discipline and, and sharpness of focus and rhythm. So it's a marvelous performance, and it really it really still sounds just terrific. A very natural sounding recording. Could use a little more bass, but otherwise it sounds very very fine. And I will say, when you're dealing with recordings of the Leningrad Symphony, if you don't have very good sonics, there's just no point. I mean, it's just a complete waste of time. It's got to blow you against the back wall at the climaxes. It just has to, you know, otherwise, otherwise you're missing a major, major element of the piece. You can't pretend it's not bombastic. It is, and intentionally so. But the only kind of bombastic that's bad is the kind that doesn't work. This bombast works if you play it, you know, loudly enough. For bombast that doesn't work, you can go to the end of Shostakovich's 12th Symphony, but this one's okay. So far, it, it, it's, it's been working. The next one that I really enjoy is Timirkanov, because you really should have a performance of the Leningrad Symphony with the Leningrad Symphony, which in this case was now the St. Petersburg Philharmonic. And there are, there are several, there are quite a few. Um, but I, I enjoy this one. Now, I saw Timurkanov do this symphony live, and like so many things he did live, he cut the living daylights out of it. I, he did a Rachmaninoff second that was sort of like the suite from Rachmaninoff second symphony. And it's customary to cut the, the adagio particularly. And also he cut a little bit of the finale. Um, he did the first movement whole. That was complete, thank God but the rest of it was all out of whack and out of balance. But fortunately, his recording is complete. He did not do cuts on the recording. And it, I think this is a splendid recording. I like his Shostakovich, and I like these performances from St. Petersburg, because you should hear the Leningrad done by what was the Leningrad and Ravinsky and those people. I mean, you know, they're all just bad sounding recordings. And he, I, it's intolerable. The symphony is intolerable in poor sound. It really is. So, RCA, Tim Rakonoff, nice to have. But there are two that I think are truly outstanding, and they could not be more different. The first of those, of these, that is, is Yarvi, with the Scottish National Orchestra, which had not yet become the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. First of all, the Chando Sonics are absolutely fabulous. They're gonna blow you through the back wall. Second of all, this is the fastest version out there. It's really zippy. Let me see how we do. Yes, 
He's got uh, 25 minutes for the first movement, which can go up to 30. And the rest of it is just exciting as hell. And I absolutely um, am a great fan of successful quick performances of the symphony. And this is the best of them. Like everything Yarvi does, it gets a little wild in places, which is not bad. You want to hear that that it's threatening to, to just go to pieces in a good way, to explode all over the place. And, uh, you know, I just love the way he lets the orchestra just cut loose. It's exactly the kind of spontaneity that you want in this music, because otherwise it sounds, it can sound very stiff and unyielding, but not here. This is just, let it all hang out, guys, and let's blow the roof off the concert hall. Yes. However, you all know, some of you who are Shostakovich fans know what the great version of this symphony is. You know, it's Bernstein with the Chicago Symphony. Here it is on Deutsche Grammophone. Not the best recorded, sonically. That's the only drawback. It's not bad by any stretch, but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, let me just put it to you this way. I saw this live. Bernstein brought it to um, Avery Fisher Hall with the Chicago Symphony. And I remember the concert vividly because first of all, he was about 20 minutes late coming out on stage. God knows what he was doing back there. He must've been in the bathroom, but he showed up and you got the Chicago Symphony brass section doubled throughout the whole thing. You had three sets of cymbals and three snare drummers. And all I can tell you is that at the end, at the end of the symphony, you could not hear the cymbals and snare drummers when they did their thing because that's how loud the brass was. And actually, if you listen to the end of this recording, you get a bit of a sense of that. It isn't It isn't that the cymbal player at the very end is a little bit timid. It's not, not, not. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a flotilla of them playing. The issue is simply that the brass is, is just so overwhelming. That concert was so extraordinary. When that symphony was over, when that symphony was over, you looked around and saw people applauding. I thought no one was applauding. But then I looked and saw that I was, and so was everybody else, but you couldn't hear them. I mean, your, your hearing was paralyzed after that concert. And that is the impression it should give. And enough of it comes across on this recording to give you a really good sense of it. Now, this is Bernstein's second recording. The first one was with the New York Philharmonic, and it was cut. That son of a bitch. Especially the silly, silly woodwind repetition, repetition in the first movement development section. He cut out the bassoon. Even he thought it was puerile and silly. But its puerility and silliness is exactly the aesthetic point that Shostakovich was making. And here, Bernstein gave it a little thought and I think figured it out. It's a fantastic performance. So those are my top five versions of the Leningrad Symphony. And like I said, you know, if you buy complete Shostakovich cycles, which is where most of them are now, they're all boxed up. I mean, they've got Barshai and Rostropovich and, you know, <laughs> and, you know Maxim Shostakovich and, and, and Sandaling and there's just, just whole bunches of Shostakovich cycles, Ashkenazi, and they have very, very good Leningrad symphonies in them. They're really good. I mean, I, there are very, very few that aren't good. I mean, Wigglesworth is good. I, you know, it's not one of the better version of things in that cycle, but it's, it's very good. High Tink is a bore. High Tink with the London Philharmonic is boring. It's too slow, too heavy. He's trying to make something profound and serious out of something which may be serious, but which expresses its seriousness through music, which is not profound. And you have to play it at tempo or a little zippier perhaps so that's a big disappointment but these five these five will do you they'll they'll do you proud and i think give you a very very good sense of what the music is and then you can turn yourself loose and enjoy it at your leisure so keep on listening folks thank you for joining me take care